Welcome everyone to the Specialist Factual Question Time session. Uh, I'm Dan Chambers from Blink Films. Uh, very good to see so many old faces here, so many new faces, and so many tired faces this morning. Now, walking here from the hotel, uh, I ran into uh, a lot of people I was impressed to see up after knowing that they were parting last night or two at three, and I'm sure none of our panel were up so late last night. No, um, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Um, I'm fortunate to be joined by a very illustrious group of commissioning editors. Um, I'm probably not supposed to say this, but I will anyway. Uh, in an area that's often so male-dominated, it's really pretty impressive to see that this panel <laughs> is predominantly female. No offence, Tom. No offence, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You are very welcome, and I, as I expect, I am too. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so... There have been a lot of successes of late in special, Specialist Factual. Um, there's, there's nothing that uh, we need to apologise for, I think. Uh, but it's getting harder. It's, um, uh, we all know that uh, uh, there are some brilliant dramas out there. They come thick and fast. And uh, comedy drama, sitcom, seems to be having a heyday. And the crime box sets that were seen on Netflix and Amazon are stealing our audiences as well. So it basically keeps us all on our metal. And so this session is about what we need to do as commissioning editors and producers to basically earn our place in the schedule. Uh, so over the next hour, I think there will be five different themes that have been um, uh, organized by Rob Holloway and Jeremy Phillips from Discovery that we'll be discussing and some clips as well. So. Uh, to our panel, Lucy Willis uh, from uh, Channel 5, the commissioning editor for Factual there, whose successes include things like Pompeii and the Blitz, stripped across, across the channel for big events. Uh, Victoria Noble from Discovery, uh, commissioning editor for Factual there, with these extraordinary gifts that keep on giving, like Salvage, uh, squad uh, and Wheeler Dealers. Yeah, salvage Hunters, yeah. Yeah, Salvage Hunters, yeah, beg yeah. your pardon. More of those later. Uh, uh, Bernie McDade from Nat Geo. Uh, there was some discussion yesterday about whether or not you were the commissioning editor for Nat Geo International or for Nat Geo uh, Premium Channels. And your answer to it was that you are the Thunder God Protector of Specialist <laughs> Factual. So that is your official <laughs> title. Thank you. Love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm modest like that. Yeah. Uh, Fatima Salaria, the new head of specialist factual at Channel 4. You've been in the job now for, what, four About months? four months, yeah. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and um, Tom McDonald, the head of almost everything factual <laughs> uh, at the BBC, uh, <laughs> natural history and specialist factual. So responsible, obviously, for shows that we all know, Blue Planet, uh, Who Do You Think You Are?, uh, the planets, many things that we'll come on to later. So to, to kick off some icebreakers, uh, to try and get some sense of uh, how we are, how you're defining your channels, uh, I'm basically going to ask you to come up with <coughs> up to five words to basically sum up what your channels are. And I'm banning the words distinctive and bold because <laughs> those are <Shit>. givens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which side should we start? Tom? I wrote them down because I'm <laughs> getting old. Um, <laughs> well done. So I put epic, dramatic, emotional, smart and timely. Thank you. They're buzzwordy but not as bad as bold. Yeah, no, yeah, good, thanks. good. <laughs> Tick. Fast enough. Um, for me, I think the biggest question, um, the biggest word that really describes everything I want to do with SF is um, challenge and question authority. It's a really big thing for me. Um, campaign for change, um, ambition, revisionist, and um, kind of making trouble. That just sums me up. Yep. <laughs> you personally. <laughs> totally. All of those things. It's like a dating project. <laughs> yes, it is. Good. We'd be together. Exactly. <laughs> Burn it. Bold, distinctive. I'm only joking. Yeah. Um, I would say relevant substance with sequins. Relevant <laughs> substance with sequins. Yeah. Fabulous. Sounds like a Disney princess. Yeah, yeah. well done. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Victoria. Okay, so immersive, international, talent-led, popular, entertaining. 
Thank you. Lucy? Uh, I'm going to see if I can remember mine. So, accessible, uh, which is very Channel 5, entertaining, great storytelling, and intelligent. Terrific. I think that sums up the individual channels and uh, channel clusters elegantly. Um, so next up, as the, the, the second icebreaker, is um, what your TV crushes are. And let's start on your side, Lucy. Okay, so TV so crushes I, meaning, it, I mean, it could be a person if you want, but I'm thinking it's either your shows or shows on other channels. So mine isn't any of those at all. When I saw the word TV crush, there was really only one answer, and it might be the same answer that all the other women on the panel give, and it has to be the sexy priest from Fleabag. <laughs> <laughs> It might be my answer. It might be yours as well. Actually, it might be yours. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Victoria. Um, so I, I absolutely love um, the uh, Ben Fogel uh, New Lives in the Wild. I love it. I think everyone wants to get away from it all, and I, you know, it's kind of fantasy home somewhere else. Terrific. Is that one of yours, Lucy? Uh, not mine personally, but yep. it's Channel Five. Yes. I wish it was one of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bernie. Uh, well, I'm quite fond of the Hot Priest myself. Yeah. I would say I would say season two of Fleabag. Season one was great, but season two, it's a Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She's really found her voice, and they're so beautifully crafted. Like every 22 minutes is just tight as a nut. Real talent. Fatima. Um, so my TV crush. I'm sorry, there's going to have to be two. Sure. Um, one of them. Uh, the first one is Chernobyl, which I really admire, and I love the epicness and the scale of that. Um, and the way that they've told a story, which at once is really, really terrifying, but also kind of draws you in. And then um, I am really in love with um, Tan from Queer Eye, um, who is everything that I am so proud that a Pakistani man from Bradford can be when he breaks over to the States. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. Sorry, I'm just thinking about Tan. <laughs> um, uh, so mine is, uh, last year I said cruising with Jim <coughs> McDonald's. So I had to really wrap my brains and not do the same again. So um, mine is... Is a series on Netflix called Russian Doll, which is, oh, okay. uh, I don't know if people have seen it, but it's a drama <coughs> series which is basically a sort of modern day version of Groundhog Day where someone in their uh, reaching middle age uh, dies over and over and over again to work out what's gone wrong with her life, and I have no idea why it resonates with me. It's, like <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's very good. Thank you. Um, so let's start the session proper after that. Um, the first uh, theme of this session is uh, supersizing specialist factual to uh, basically help it break through, help it get noticed. Uh, how we shout louder, whether it's just a question of spending more money or whether there are other things that we can do to basically break through the noise. Uh, let me start with you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, and I promise this won't be like last year, where it ended up being you getting fired most of the questions. That won't happen. Um, but to start off with you, uh, you've had some huge hits this year on natural history. Blue Planet 2, uh, Dynasties, The Planets was big in science. Those shows are all about spending large sums of money, but you spend it well, and they're great shows. Uh, is that the key part of the strategy in terms of supersizing things, or are there other parts of the... Uh, genre of specialist factual that you intend to supersize as well? I mean, I think it depends what you mean by supersizing, because I think in some ways the, the, the reason you might want to supersize is you want to have impact and you want to reach as big or broad an audience as possible. So, of course, if you're doing things which are sort of landmark in scale, of course what you hope is that they're going to reach a big, broad audience. And I would say that natural history, because it's not driven by words, it's driven by pictures, has a sort of universal appeal to it. And, of course, storytelling, drama storytelling is, sits at the heart of it. I think that's certainly... Certainly in the time that I've been running Specialist Factual, I've been influenced by the storytelling that we've evolved and developed in natural history, and, and I feel like I've really helped push that with programme makers into the other specialist genres that me and my team work in. So I think Planets, which is the Brian Cox series on air at the moment, though in some ways is a sort of distant relative of Wonders of the Solar System, mm. if you put the two shows next to each other, they're actually very, very, very different in terms of their mode of delivery. And I think what we've managed to achieve with Planets is something which feels like it has a drama and an emotional narrative at the heart of it, which is a hard thing to 
do with science. I mean, I think that's also true in history. You know, Simon and Abby in my team have really worked to sort of pivot the history content to be probably more 20th century, more immediate, more direct, more emotional. So that I, I, I like to think that Specialist Factual at its best has the ability to work on two levels. One is a sort of intellectual pleasure of sort of understanding new things, and the other is a sort of emotional engagement. And I think that the, the trick is how do you combine both those things at the same time? I mean, that's certainly something that we've done a lot of, you know, Fatima's obviously moved on to Channel 4 now, but Fatima and I did a lot together in the religion output as well. But I think it doesn't, it's not, to answer your question more succinctly, it's not just about scaling up in terms of volume. I don't think it's about going, right, let's spend another million quid on that and let's do 20 of them. You know, when we did uh, the Liz Bonin film, Drowning in Plastic, last year, it was a one-off 90-minute film. I think it had huge impact and it carried on the sort of legacy story started by Blue Planet 2, continued by David Brindley's team with the war and plastic series with you friendly whistling stall last night it felt like we were delivering something which the audience wanted to know so it's sort of trying to be responsive and reactive and i suspect i don't want to doom everything that's coming on my slate for the rest of the year but i suspect our most impactful film of the year has gone out already which was the david Attenborough climate change the facts film it was a 60 minute film but i think you know partly through luck if you like the extinction rebellion were marching outside the bbc's offices as it was going on air but it felt like we just got chose the right moment to deliver that story to the audience and we had a very receptive audience i think you know i didn't think that close to 4 million people and then when you add on iplayer over 4 million people would come to that film so I think it's sort of it I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think the trick is just going let's throw money at it and let's do loads of them good clear all right Thank you. yeah good terrific <laughs> uh, let me let me go to Bernie yes. um, so in the last few years last couple of years uh, Nat Geo has repositioned itself as uh, Nat Geo 2.0 with these huge shows where it feels like you've gone and raided Hollywood for all their top <laughs> talent and um, uh, and you've got Darren Aronofsky making films and Will Smith and Morgan Freeman fronting them uh, and it feels uh, epic in its nature uh, so my question to you, Bernie, is, is it working? And is that part of the ongoing strategy of Nat Geo, just to go large? Yeah. So it, the way we look at global premium program, which shows like Mars, directed by Ron Howard, One Strange Rock with Will Smith, etc., is that is our, uh, those shows are our ambassador for the brand worldwide. So as a commercial channel, we have different incentives and motivations than say a public service broadcaster would. We have to cut through the clutter and we have to make noise. Um, so there's, it, it's a very, uh, it's a very um, detailed and deliberate strategy. Um, and what we're trying to do, or what we are doing, is um, we're, we're drawing people to our our content that perhaps normally wouldn't come, you know, and it's it's worth noting that our highest rated shows on the net in the network history are Story of God with Morgan Freeman, Mars directed by Ron Howard, um, Genius, which was the drama that we did with um, with Einstein, and uh, you know, and they they're the manifestation of this strategy. But what we're looking for specifically. And, you know, rather than talk about what we are doing, it might be helpful to talk about what we look for in ideas, because I know there's a lot of filmmakers in the room. And there's a couple of key things on the checklist that I always run ideas through. The first is it's worth keeping in mind that as a brand, National Geographic uh, wants to be aspirational and inspirational. So if you look at your ideas through that lens, so we're not going to do murder or drugs or, you know, kind of like the, the um, you know, the more gritty, depressing stuff. We want to be like inspirational and aspirational, as I said. A couple of things to on the checklist. Entertainment first. I said substance with sequence. We're about bringing in the viewer through entertaining, and what we see as a real goal is that people don't actually know that they've learned something until you know the next day, where they're chatting to a friend, and suddenly they realise that we've, um, you know, that they've picked up all this stuff. I sometimes call it science by stealth, as well. Um, relevance: What is it about this show that could only be made now? 
Um, so Drain the Oceans, for example, has pioneered a new technology where we can like, literally drain the oceans and see uh, the, what lies underneath in a way we never have before. So we're always looking for that, you know, what is it that makes it why we could only tell the story now. And then global appeal, I think, Dan, you had mentioned before, like of all the commissioners up here, I, I commission for global, not domestic. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in 173 countries in 43 languages. So, you know, the story about the, uh, you know, the, the public housing situation in Withingshaw outside Manchester, that's not going to work for us. So everything has to be big, noisy, relevant, and ideally returnable as well. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, on to Fatima. Now, you are new in the job. Uh, at BBC, you reached scale not through splashing the cash, but through some really brilliant commissions like British Jews and Muslims like us, where they became national talking points for a week or two. Um, uh, is it too early to ask you what the strategy at Channel 4 is and some of the early commissions? Uh, no, I don't think it's too early. I think the simplest way for me to kind of articulate that is to say that everything that I did at um, the BBC is an ambition to kind of do those similar kind of gritty stories that really matter to me. Um, so all the stuff that you don't want to do, Bernie, all the murder and the drugs is the stuff that I would really want to go for. Um, I can never compete with Tom on so many levels. You, um, we are perfectly complimentary so far. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, wait, budget wait. and hours. But I think the biggest thing to me um, is basically getting those stories that really matter. And the reason that you know I wanted to champion those stories at the BBC is exactly the same reason I want to do it at Channel 4. I want to get... For me, the impacts that we can make at Channel 4 are through the stories that we try and tell. So, you know, trying to find the underdog, trying to find stories that can really cut through in terms of who we are uh, as a channel and being really distinctive. I think the key for me is when I'm looking at ideas and when I'm sitting down with the team, um, we're looking at ideas and we're basically thinking, you know what, these are slightly too middle of the road for us. What's going to make it really cut through for us? Which is going to be the story that's going to bring the same kind of impact that I did three identical strangers brought, what's the kind of story that we can kind of forensically really look down to like an Everland would do and we can do all of that with Specialist Factual because we're so broad and we're so big but for me the ambition has always got to be trying to find the stories that can kind of you know tell us tell us things about the world that we don't know and that's always something that I've always wanted to do and um, so in terms of the team you know we've got one of one of the ideas just building on the, um, the murder um, ambition for me and the crime, because we know that true crime rates, we know that people really come to those stories, and we know that it's a kind of window on the world and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we, an idea that was commissioned um, very early on um, and was commissioned before I came there, which I built with um, Jonah Weston, was something that um, Dragonfly and a company called Underworld had kind of brought to us about murder. And what, what was exciting for me were two things, not just the idea, but the fact of putting a blue chip company like Dragonfly um, together with a company that had ex-criminals in there. So the layer that they were bringing and the collaboration that these two companies were going to bring together was something that I find culture changing. And so when people are, you know, and that's something that I'd say to everybody that look for those kind of collaborations which kind of feel innovative but also bring different kind of voices to that table. So, you know, you've got the brilliant Tom Pullen from Dragonfly will be executing that with Adam Boone from um, Underworld. And you've got ex-criminals sitting there together developing that idea and bringing you the unheard voices that we had in We Are British Jews, Muslims Like Cars, Abortion on Trial, all of those big shows that we did at the BBC, that I want to have that ambition there. Um, but underpinning all of that murder is science. And to me, it's the foundations of science and it's the kind of landmark science that I want to do. But I want to bring that documentary edge to it so that I can get a bigger and broader audience and I can get people who might come to the channel that, you know, that wouldn't come before. So I think that's, that's a kind of sense of direction in terms of where I want to go to. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to Lucy. Uh, now, it's no secret that 
Channel 5 has less money than the BBC uh, uh, and certainly than Nat Geo, but you have had quite a few successes of late with Specialist mm -hmm. Factual, uh, and for you, it is about being seen, be punching through. So how have you done it? What's the strategy at Channel 5 for supersizing? Yeah, I mean, it, it has really worked over the last three or four years, actually, and I think what we realise is that we've got a very broad audience at Channel 5, but they're an audience that really are interested in history. So what's, I think, really important for us is to take a lot of those very classic history subjects, and I'm talking about history because that's largely specialist factual for us yeah. at Channel 5, and then once we've sort of settled on, I suppose, what you could call those blockbuster um, historical periods, the challenge for me is to find something new to say or a fresh way of doing it. And I sort of come originally from a sort of factual documentary background. So one thing that we've been doing in the last two or three years, which I think is working well for us, is taking a familiar subject, so something like Pompeii, for example, and then stripping it over three nights and telling the story as a continuing narrative, which I guess you can also sort of say borrows from not just sort of Netflix, but some of those sort of podcast aesthetics which we saw coming through with Serial. So it gives you an appointment to view. It kind of lands in the schedule in a really big way, but it also gives you a reason to come back the next night. And then the other thing that I'm always doing is really, really pushing the production companies that are working with us. And we've got some really lovely companies working with us now to try and find something new to say. So if I take the Pompeii Strept event that we did last year, for example, um, what was interesting about that was it was made by Voltage, who are actually more of a factual documentary company. They'd done no history at all, I think. Um, so they bought a very sort of broad aesthetic to the um, series, but I then also pushed them very hard to find something new to say. Um, and they had new excavations. They managed, and God knows how they did it. I think it was a total nightmare. But they have these famous casts at Pompeii, and they managed to persuade the authorities at Pompeii, who are very hard to deal with, to let them take these casts off-site and take them to a local hospital and put them through an MRI scanner, which was just extraordinary. So, in fact, um, on the day that they did it, all the doctors that were on their day off came into the hospital to see these sort of amazing casts. So I will always um, push the production companies as, as much as possible to try and find a new way of looking at a familiar subject. Um, and that's something I want to do a lot more of. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, uh, so on Discovery, Discovery UK and Europe, uh, it seems as a viewer that it's not always about going big. It's sometimes just about identifying those shows, like we mentioned before, uh, Salvage Hunters uh, and Wheeler Dealers, and giving your audience what you know they want and not messing with them. Is that a fair summary of, of how you look at it? Well, I think we're commissioning a specialist factual um, that works internationally in a, number of, in a number of genres, so be that sort of a science or salvage or turbo or engineering. And we've had great success with Salvage Hunters. And we are looking to super serve that audience. You know, they want more from us. Uh, and there's an opportunity there to grow that franchise. So we've created Salvage Hunters Classic Cars and Salvage Hunters The Restorers. And the fans are of that, of that franchise are loving it. And actually, um, both of those series, when they premiered, had sort of highest new series ratings. And actually, what we saw was it also drove ratings to, to the original <coughs> Salvage Hunters series. So it's working very well for that audience. I think we've also done that, you know, Gold Rush is a huge international global hit for discovery, and actually in the UK and Australia, we've created shows with um, Prospero and Electric. We've got um, 
outback opal hunters and Aussie gold hunters. And we've super served our audience in that space. And actually, we're seeing uh, Aussie gold hunters just premiering their third series in the UK. And it's, it's, it's incredible. The sort of premiere is up, up double digits on, on, on last seasons. So that is working really well for us. But I think we're also pushing, you know, we've got um, recently announced Richard Hammond's Big, which is a hugely ambitious series for us. Oh, um, there's a clip of it, isn't there? There is. Can we yes. see the clip? Yes. And then talk so, about it afterwards? Yes, so this is, so what I've discovered about Richard Hammond is he doesn't like heights. <laughs> okay. So um, that's um, straight from the edit. We've just shot one show so far. When you commissioned that, did yeah. you know that Richard... Hammond was shit scared of heights, or was that just an added bonus when he started making it? I knew he was scared of yeah. heights. <laughs> yeah. And in every show, have you got him scaling large buildings? Is Not that his quite. USP? Maybe. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. I, I, think, I think the thing about Richard is, you know, he's a huge international talent, um, and he really allows us to be entertaining. Um, in engineering a genre that, you know, can be a bit dry. So actually he's really injecting um, entertainment and that's what we've charged Chimp to do, to really create um, an, inter um, an entertaining series for us. And I think, you know, Richard is passionate about engineering. He's invested, um, you know, he's joyous about it. And I've been really impressed at how he sort of applied himself to the subject matter and how much time he's spending on the series and in the series. And, you know, I think we're really sort of pushing that genre and I think that's really important for us. So I think, I think we, are, we are pushing into new spaces and creating entertaining twists. Um, and we are also supersizing and looking to scale up with more hours on genres that we know are, and franchises that we know are extremely successful. Thank you. So this takes us on to the next theme, uh, which is faces. Uh, Richard Hammond's interesting because he started life at the BBC on Top Gear and then he went to Amazon. Uh, he now uh, is clearly on Discovery and, um, uh, and, and other channels are trying for him as well, aren't they? Uh, faces clearly make a big difference in Specialist Factual. You put a well-known face on something, we all know uh, a larger audience comes. Um, but there seems to be a diminishing pool of faces uh, that all the channels want. Uh, and often at briefing sessions, we hear about the importance of fresh faces, new faces, go and find me a face we've not seen before. And you sometimes feel as a producer that uh, it's a bit of a mugs game, that you can work really hard trying to find those new faces. And actually, at the end of the day, what the broadcasters want are established faces that will bring in uh, the viewers. So uh, I want to talk now about the role of faces on all of your channels um, uh, to try and get a sense of how you do it and how you use those faces to, to bring those extra audiences. So Fatima, can we start with you on this? Uh, I know it's a bit mean because you've only been there for four months, but there is a show that you have commissioned that yeah. has a big, interesting new face. Uh, let me let you introduce it. Okay, so this is a show that was commissioned before I came. Um, it was um, in its early infancy, and so um, we worked together, Jonah worked together with Claudia Lewis from studios on it. Um, what I really liked about this story, um, and what I really liked about this talent, was that everybody knows who he is, everybody kind of has a perception of who he is, um, he's a national treasure, but he... Um, like a lot of people who have kind of achieved huge amounts of success when that's kind of taken away from them, you kind of sit there and you ponder and you think, who am I, what am I, where do I belong? You know, what is my purpose in life? And um, that's what really drew me to him because other than the fact that I knew that he'd be brilliant in the show, what I really wanted to be able to use that show to, to explore as well as the, the engineering, the science and the kind of jeopardy of it was who this person was going to be at the end of this journey. Um, um, and I didn't, we don't know, we still don't know because he's so Tell us who unpredictable. It is, so, this is a show with Bradley Wiggins, who um, should have been here this week, but um, it's Bradley Wiggins basically. Um, so, you know, he's, he's somebody who's going through. Um, you know, lots of change in his life. He's questioning who he is, who he, you know, where he, what he belongs to. That's what really attracted me to him, as well as the science. So, this is a clip that um, we've done.
So that is made by BBC Studios for Channel, Channel 4. Channel 4. Is that yes. one of the first Channel 4 BBC commissions? Uh, no, I think there's been one before. Right. Um, but I'm really, really excited to be working with them on this. Um, and I'm really excited. You know, she, the team really thought about this in a left-field way. You know, I know that the science is there. I know the expertise is there. I know that we're going to get this. And what we... Uh, they, they basically thought about him, and I was slightly unsure about him. And then, as they started to talk to me about it, I realised that, you know what, this is what's going to make this story feel bigger and broader for me. And you can just see from that that you are going to be going on a roller coaster of a journey with this guy, that you are going to be exploring somebody who's got a passion for cycling, who really wants to do something different, but also is going to talk about his life. In, and Bradley's obviously got an, um, an amazing story. And I remember saying to the guys, I need some of that story to come out. That's really important for me because that's emotional engagement. And with all of the projects that I want to do and, and, and the way that I want to use my talent, is that I, I need them to have a passion. And I know that Specialist Factual is considered to be quite homeworky, it's quite academic, it's all of that stuff. You can find all of those people. They're there. We just need to look a little bit harder and find the difference in them. We need to just work a little bit harder and we need to find different voices. We all know that they're, that they're there. One of my biggest desires is that I need to get women into that kind of travelogue adventure phase. I have lots of fellows on my channel doing lots of exciting SAS type stuff. They're brilliant at what they do, but you, you cannot deny the fact that when we had women in the latest, um, the last series of SAS, that was one of the most popular um, series for the channel. That was the most popular one. So, you know, we are building in on, we are, we are reinventing things slightly in, uh, with the turn of a wheel. But in terms of the talent that we use, I just think that, you know, we've got to find different voices. You know, we, we did it at the BBC. I, I was so lucky to be able to work with people like Adnan Sawar. I was able to kind of nurture and develop people like Marion Baig, who's now got a BBC Two show and is working with Tom on BBC One. I mean, these are people that two years ago, she was a teacher in Tottenham. You know, her life has completely transformed. And it's transformed in a way that she is now inspiring a generation of Muslim women, um, but also women, to think and look at her and think, do you know what? I can do that. I can do that. We just, as a production base, have to just work a lot harder to find those kind of voices. And, you know, I know it's difficult. I will support you, and I know other people, other broadcasters will support you to kind of do that. But, you know, it's, it's something that, as you can tell, is something that we all really believe in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We will bring you Thank those you. people. <laughs> um, Victoria, uh, let's talk about faces on uh, your channels. You're obviously commissioning for the UK, but also more globally. Yeah. Uh, Richard Hammond clearly works. Are there other faces who you are looking to get? Are a type of face you're looking to attract? Sure. So, so I think our talent um, um, always wants to be authentic, credible, um, an expert and, uh, and passionate, really passionate about what they're doing and emotionally invested. And you saw that there with Richard Hammond. And we, we're working with, you know, global talent and established faces, but we're also really keen to um, support new talent and grow new talent. When we launched Goblin Works Garage um, last year, we, we cast for a female mechanic, a female designer. I wanted to put a female in that traditionally male space. And we found Helen Stanley, who's brilliant. And we're now in a <coughs> second series of Goblin Works Garage, and she's done some work for the BBC too. And it's brilliant. It's really exciting, breaking and growing new talent. And in fact, in Goblin Works Garage, th th there were, there were, there's three characters. Jimmy Deville was a talent that we also launched. And, and Anne Partridge is a new talent. His first show is Goblin Works Garage. So we're really keen to kind of get out there and work with our producers, in this instance, um, Rick Murray from Worker B, to find new talent. You look at Ed Stafford, you know, who is uh, one of the world's premier global survival talents, actually 
you know, he started working with us eight years ago, um, walking the Amazon, and we've grown and supported him. We've just had First Man Out, um, which has been our sort of competition format that has worked well, and we've just filmed another immersive um, special with him that hasn't been announced. So I think we're really keen to work with new talent, as well as those sort of global established faces and actually First Man Out is a great um, opportunity to try out new talent because actually Ed Stafford's going up against lots of different survivalists and we've got, you know, he's going up against males and females so it's quite exciting actually for us to really be putting this talent out there on screen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Lucy, so faces that have been on Channel 5 recently, mm. uh, Bethany Hughes, Dan Snow, Michael Portillo, Michael Palin, it would feel like these might be people that you could have seen on the BBC a few years ago. Is that yeah. a deliberate strategy to try and take very established BBC faces and bring them over to Channel 5? I don't know if it's a deliberate strategy, but what we really want to do is, in some of our specialist factual programming, have really big names who we know will bring an audience. So I suppose if... There's one thing <coughs> more than anything else that um, I really care about. It's making history and Specialist Factual on Channel 5 accessible and popular. And so I think people like Bethany... I mean, one of the things I love about Bethany and Dan Snow, he hasn't yet been on the channel, but he's going to be later in the year, and I'm really excited about that, is they're both really intelligent but they're unbelievably passionate about history, and they're both on an enormous mission to make history accessible to a really wide audience. So they're, I guess, the antithesis of that kind of quite patronising, maybe a little bit snobby type of historian that maybe you would have seen sort of six or seven years ago. They just love the idea of getting as many people as possible engaged in history. And I love that too. But what we um, try and do as well, so I've got a series coming up later in the year with Dan Snow, but he's been teamed with two other people. So he's working with John Sargent, who is hilariously funny in this stripped series, um, a history series. But he's also working with Raksha Dave, who's not completely new. She worked on Time Team as an archeologist on Channel 4, but we've really been building her up actually over the last year or two and turning her into more of a presenter, which according to the production company is quite tricky because that's not her sort of natural bent. But so for us, I think what works is using a combination of um, big names to attract an audience and then sometimes teaming them with lesser known names. But then there's other people that we've grown ourselves, like Dan Jones, for example, Rob Bell, um, Susanna Lipscomb. But we are very excited to have some of the big names on the channel. And um, that's a great thing for us. Yeah. yeah. And they bring viewers, and that's really important. We yeah. can't sort of underestimate that. How do you feel, Tom, about Lucy spinning <laughs> some of your faces? <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful looking at Channel 5 and seeing our faces <laughs> most nights of the week. No, um, I, I think there's a really, there are sort of interesting strands here, I think, to pull out in terms of talent, because I think often you're right, Dan, that commissioners say, I want new talent. And I think, of, I, I would say, everyone sitting here, of course, is looking for new talent. The truth is, you know, when I worked in the indie sector, finding new talent is really hard and it involves a lot of investment and a lot of time. But from the commissioning side, I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough or celebrated enough is, is growing talent and developing a relationship with that talent over many, many, many years, which, is, which allows a relationship of trust between that presenter and a production company and with a broadcaster. So I know that something like the Chris Packham Asperger's film simply would not have happened if Chris had not had a very, very good relationship with the BBC over decades. And I think there's something to be said for the fact that many of the people sitting in this room, or maybe I'm just showing a side of my age, grew up with Chris Packham on the television. And I think, I think the other thing that's interesting about Chris is that he does not look like or sound like what I think most commissioners would think they want. Do you know what I mean? So, so when Fatima was talking about people who are passionate, I think it's also people who are really surprising. Chris Packham and Mary Beard, I think, are two examples of people who, if you made a classic taster tape, 
relationship with them, you'd probably go, what? Do you know what I mean? So I think it's about sort of taking risks with talent, but also trying to have a plan and a strategy for them. <clears throat> so last year, we one of the things that, uh, that my team try and do all the time is balance what are we doing so that we have a, a, a genuine career for the talent that work with us? It's not just, here's your one show, bugger, we don't know what else to do with you, but also making sure there's always room for new voices. So in some ways, I think Dan Snow's a fantastic broadcaster, and of course, he's still on the BBC doing D-Day last week, but, but actually Dan doing things for other broadcasters gives us the opportunity to work with other talent. So last year, <coughs> we had Yasmin Khan, who'd never presented before, doing Passage to Britain, which was a wall-to-wall -wall series. We had Dr. Goody Singh doing Babies, which was a science series, both put, which are made by Voltage, both pushed straight into peak at the same time as we were doing interesting things and trying to progress and grow what Chris is doing or Liz Bonin's doing or David Attenborough's doing. So I think it's a real balancing act. I think the other thing that not just my team or department, but, but across Factual, the BBC has done really, really well, is the thing that Victoria was saying, which is sort of putting talent into new and surprising places. So I've talked about the Chris Packham documentary, but uh, uh, it didn't come from our department, but the Nadia Hussein film about anxiety, which was on BBC One a few weeks ago, I think that film genuinely will change the audience's relationship with Nadia and their perception of Nadia. So I think sometimes it's about how you use talent in a way which is surprising and fresh. Um, I think the other thing, if I'm really honest, is that we are using fewer presenters. You know, that mode of presenter-led telly, I think broadly is going, you know, these things going cycles in telly. And of course, you know, our most successful show on air at the moment is The Planet, presented by Brian Cox. So what do I know? But we've tried, especially in history, to focus very much on people telling their stories in their voice. You know, we know that, that a younger audience in particular don't like their content to be so mediated. And a presenter immediately, even if they're polemical or have a point of view or are immersive, are mediating <coughs> the experience. And so some of what we're doing is going, well, so when we did our Blitz series a few years ago, the classic BBC way of doing the Blitz would have been probably Dan Snow, you know, and to go, I'm going to tell you a World War II story. But the way that we did it was through testimony, documents, maps, and it was a sort of tapestry of a series that used expert voices but didn't do it in that sort of presenter on a hill way. So at the same time as we want new voices, we also need to make sure that we protect the voices that the audience love. You know, I'm not going to turn around and go, sorry, David Attenborough, I've got to put this new voice on. Yeah, what is yeah, it yeah. not taking you? So, so it, I think it's a balancing act. Yeah, balancing act, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bernie, uh, you have got some of the biggest names presenting your shows in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, does it mean that as producers here coming to you, if we haven't got George Clooney attached to your project, then you might as well not knock on your door? Um, it, very much not. Like, if you have an mm. idea with scale, um, ambition and innovative and feels completely original, but we do know George Clooney <laughs> and we do know Will Smith, so we can, help at, we can help attach those people. So that is absolutely not a barrier to entry. Um, it helps to think about who you think the A-list talent would be, and it's important that they're organic. Like Story of God with Morgan Freeman, what a great example that is, um, you know, of completely organic talent. So have a think about it, but it, it, you know, I absolutely encourage you to bring us the um, big, bold ideas. And it's also worth pointing out, so obviously we deal at that A-list uh, Hollywood level. Um, also, there's another level where we call it, um, or I call it, existing IP hosts. So we have a series with Bear Grylls, um, we have a series called The Curiosity of Jeff Goldblum, um, another one, uh, Uncharted with Gordon Ramsay. And each of those names, they already carry a brand in themselves that helps us cut through the clutter from a marketing perspective. You know, you know, everyone knows Jeff Goldblum's kind of quirky, so you know exactly what that show is. Um, we're also putting a lot of effort into Finding new talent, this, this week, actually running concurrently in DC, there's an Explorers Symposium, and 
we have a team there right now shooting these explorers so we can see what they're like on camera and just assess who are we targeting, uh, you know, that we may be able to grow. Um, someone who was on Explorer, Mariana Van Zeller, we have uh, broken her out and given her own series called Trafficked that will be coming up later this year. And, um, and also someone that we've been growing in-house is a technologist and Nat Geo Explorer called Albert Lin. And we've done, we've done a number of projects with him. Um, he first came to our attention when uh, Lucy Van Beek from Blakeway did the first, emperor's to, first Chinese Emperor's Tomb. That's not the right title, it's something like that. And, um, you know, and Albert was great, completely, you know, fresh and new. And um, we're actually having a panel this afternoon upstairs in the Adelphi at two o'clock inside Nat Geo, and we're gonna, um, dive deeper into how we've grown Albert as talent and also show clips where you can see an excerpt from the 2015 Chinese Emperor show, which was great for the time, but then when you see what we're shooting with him now in Lost Cities, it's absolute night and day. And I think that also marks a shift in how we use talent that taps into what Tom was saying. Like previously, I have found talent to be very kind of authoritarian, so I'm the font of knowledge and I'm going to tell you, the viewers, what I know. And what we've been trying to do is, is change that, so um, specifically with Albert, for an example, it's trying to make him relatable, so it's not you're being told as a viewer, it makes it more immersive, so you're there with him. Um, you know, and again, the panel this afternoon will show some clips that illustrate that. But w one of the things that, that I really love is he, uh, there's a show called, um, it was originally called Bible from Space when I commissioned it, but we changed the title to Buried Secrets of the Bible. So um, anyway, it was a great, 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 great show. Absolutely beautiful job done by Caravan. And one of my favorite moments is he walks up to the top of Masada, you know, this gorgeous panoramic vista. And you can just see the incredible, you know, the look of amazement on his face. And he says, three days ago, I was taking my kids to school and took a traffic jam. You know, so there's like little bits like that. So it's not like the voice, the voice of God of old. Um, it's very much relatable. Thank you. Now, I'm very aware, looking at the time, that uh, we've only tackled two of the themes, and there oh. were three others. So I think what we're going to do now is just race through some of the others, because there are some clips to show as well. Um, uh, and I'm going to press you all to be more succinct in your answers, if I may. Yes. Um, the third theme is innovation, um, doing something different, being properly bold, dare I say, original. Uh, when it works, it's bloody brilliant, uh, and everyone loves you for it. When it doesn't work, you feel like a klutz and think, what on earth was I thinking? Um, it's, um, uh, my question here, I suppose, is rather than going through all of you individually, is who would you say, who would nominate themselves here as saying innovation is most important for them as a representative of their channel? I think we all would, wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, which, <laughs> which channels should be innovating in our e ecosystem? We all, all should be the... innovating. I think yeah. whether you've got a returning series, you've got to keep that fresh and grow. You've got to innovate. But there, there are degrees of innovation. So I would say for Discovery or for Channel 5, there isn't the weight of expectation from the viewer that you innovate all the time. For the public service channels, for BBC and particularly Channel 4, there's a big expectation of innovation. I mean, the innovation happens at different levels. I suppose what I'm sure. talking about is the major risks the things that may leave you outside, naked, humiliated, uh, but if they work, everyone smothers you in baby kisses. Look, certainly I sort of think, look, uh, in a public service, baby kisses, sort of, yeah. <laughs> I, don't I, I don't know if I want those. Um, maybe I won't innovate anymore. Um, uh, uh, look, if you're in a, a, pub a public service broadcaster, you don't have the commercial imperative where if the ratings are, are down, you, you're not suddenly going to lose loads of advertising share and, you know, it, your budget's going to get cut. I think innovation's a really interesting thing, though, because I think that, again, there's a real tension here, which is I think our principal job as commissioners is to serve the audience. And I certainly feel that with, because our audience are licence fee payers, that actually innovation as a sort of thing to do in itself, frankly, seems futile to me. If you're 
just innovating for the sake of it, or frankly, innovating to show off at panels like this, where you went, we did this big, brave, bold thing. So part of what we're trying to do all the time is go, I think there is, uh, there is no shame in saying, not that it sits on my slate, that a show like Country File does incredible numbers, and I'm sure the production team, in fact, I know the production team, think every year about how you innovate within yes. that. So how do you refresh it? How do you make it feel good? If everything was Country File, of course, we wouldn't be doing our job right. So I do think it's, a, a, again, I do think it's a real balancing act. I guess I've never felt that if we take a risk with something that I'm going to have anything but baby kisses, frankly, because the egg on my face thing, I just, I, I just don't recognise it because I think actually, as long as you do it with real integrity and thoughtfulness and purpose, then I think people resp respect it and respond to it. And, you know, the thing that I, you know, Fasma and I used to say when we worked together on some of the things that we did together was always, if, and I always, and I, we say this a lot inside the BBC and Factual, is that if you don't have things in your sl slate that are really terrifying and yes. that keep you awake at night, you're doing something wrong. Mm. So I think it's really important. Yeah. It's also a new way of telling a story. Mm. It's a new way of telling a story. It's a new way of getting an audience to a really familiar subject. And, and in the world that we live, you know, I have kids who don't watch telly anymore, but I want them to learn about this world that we live in. So, you know, we, we're doing um, Moon Landing Live, uh, 72 are doing that for us for the 50th anniversary. And the way we're telling that story is that there's no comma in it, it's all archive, it's all, you know, it's, it's footage from back in that time. And the, the thing, the beauty for me of that program is that it transports you back into that world. So I want to sit there with my 14-year-old boy and I want to be part of that audience that were there in their camper vans, that were there watching this spectacular moment um, and, and to be able to enjoy that, but to be able to have a dialogue with him and for him to actually learn something. So it's about, for me, it's about a new way of telling history and a new way of telling a story and a new way of bringing in that audience that is incredibly important to us. I mean, it's interesting, so good to say, because I think because this is Specialist Factual, one of the things that I think people often talk about is technology drives innovation in Specialist Factual. And I think, you know, just from some of the clips and some of the things that I know that people are announcing, I think Specialist Factual has tended to always be on the forefront of innovation as a genre, partly because that new tech becomes something. And, that, and, and I think indies who make a lot of Specialist Factual are also very thoughtful about how you tell a story in a new way or what's the twist on that story. So I don't think it's always a sort of wham, bam, let's do it live. I think sometimes it can be a, a tweak or a twist of something that makes a subject feel fresh. Yeah. And I but think also, me, I was going to say, I think innovation means different things for each channel, for yeah. example. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about innovation, I have to do it within certain constraints. You know, I have to keep the programme broad and popular unless I decide to do something, you know, which I do very occasionally that's a bit out there. We're doing a um, single, actually, with The Garden where we're comparing... Donald Trump with Henry VIII, which I think is going to be quite interesting, <laughs> and I have absolutely no idea what it's going to end up um, looking like <laughs> and what they're going to say, but I think there are definitely some comparisons. Um, but I think innovation and evolution are always yeah. really important, and I think it was really interesting seeing 63 Up, actually, on the TV this week. I mean, it is an amazing series, and I absolutely love it, but it does feel very much of its time and very dated. And so I think evolving the process of programme making is something that we've all got to do. Otherwise, we would end up making programmes that looked like they'd sort of started in the 1960s or 1970s. But one thing that I'm you know, also really interested in at Channel 5 is... And I, I feel that this, for Channel 5, is a kind of innovation, is creating more hybrid history. Um, I think it's partly a, a sort of a result of the background that I come from, but I'm really interested, and I think it's a bit of what Fatima and Tom have both been talking about, but when you take, you know, for example, on the series Inside the Tower of London, which I did last year, um, when Lion bought that series to me originally, and it was kind of quite a long process to get it to air because the access was really difficult. So the tower hadn't given... They'd given access for kind of interviews and to go in and do bits and pieces, but they hadn't given big access for a sort of access all areas series for, I think, 15 years. And when Lion and I first started talking about it, um, you know, Bill at Lyon was really interested in a very specialist factual approach, and I was really interested in combining 
a traditional specialist factual with an observational approach. So we talked an awful lot about how does observational sit alongside, you know, these classic history stories from the Tower of London, and how do you mesh the two of them together? How do you get from an obdoc scene um, with a beef eater doing X, Y, or Z um, into a piece of traditional history? Um, so, and I think we've got a we clip, clip of that actually. So maybe we should have a look at it. So it's sort of like X Factor for baby ravens, actually, <laughs> in that clip. Um, so, you know, what you would start starts from the forthcoming series, which will go out later this year. But, you know, probably what I should have shown is how that then transitions into a piece of more traditional history. And I, I suppose I'm calling it hybrid history, but it's something that I'm really interested in doing quite a lot more of. Um, you know, how do you take one genre and how do you meld it with specialist factual? So that might be observational and traditional history, or it might be fact tent, which I think is one of the other topics. Um, we've got a 90 minute coming up later in the year where we're actually taking the traditional... It's a very straightforward idea, and I was really surprised no one had pitched it to me before, but we're taking the list format, which is a completely fact temp format, and we do it quite a lot on Channel 5, and we're applying it to history. So it couldn't be more straightforward, but hopefully what it does is make for an entertaining way of looking at some, you know, um, hopefully popular historical periods. Um, so... Really, that's one thing I'm really actively searching for at the moment is those genre-melding hybrid history ideas. Thank you. Because we're short on time, the, the other two themes that we were going to talk about are the uh, law of classic specialist factual subjects, uh, Nazis, Tutankhamun, uh, <laughs> Pompeii, <clears throat> all of those subjects that we know are bankers, uh, and <clears throat> the... Um, the, the, whether it makes sense to superserve that heavy audience or to uh, avoid it. I think we might have to save that for another time. And the other thing we're going to talk about is um, the effect of the streamers, the Netflix and the Amazons, on what you're all doing. Uh, so again, I think we might have to save that for another time. What I'd like to, because we've only got 10 minutes left, is open it up to questions. If anyone's got questions on either of those things, that would be terrific. Um, uh, if not, I can ask away. But Anyone in the audience with any questions that they would like to ask? You can, yes. Uh, so for the, uh, uh, the classic specialist factual subject area, um, uh, Tom has got a clip which is an example of the BBC moving away from the obvious subjects. Do you want to introduce it? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it, you could argue it is in some ways classic specialist factual, but an evolution of it. I mean, I talked about drowning in plastic before, and I think one of the hallmarks of our natural history content over the last few years is to really grapple with the very fast changing world that we live in. You know, so the BBC's made a commitment uh, for a strand of programmes over the next decade called, uh, under a banner called Our Planet Matters. Uh, drowning in plastic did very, very well for us, and I think raised a subject that was absolutely in the public's consciousness. Uh, the follow-up film, if you like, that we're doing with Liz Bonin is about the meat industry. So I think the idea that you would have seen hard-hitting environmental films in peak time on BBC One five years ago, I don't think people would have quite believed it, so I think it's very, very brave of Charlotte to have found space for these kind of films on BBC One because BBC One is still, you know, the most watched channel in the UK. So, but I think the other thing to say, and I was mentioning this before, re Liz Bonin. Liz Bonin has, is a broadcaster who we have been working with now for over a decade. She started out on Bang Goes the Theory. She then did lots of poppy animal shows for us, Animal Odd Couples, Animals in Love. And I think, you know, to have a diverse female expert voice who we have been working with for over a decade doing peak term films on BBC One could only have happened with a long-term commitment to her. And I think as a broadcaster, she's really grown. Anyway, this is literally, I feel really unfair showing it because they've done one filming trip. They've not even started their edit, but here is a little clip, which is not really an edit. It's just some moments from um, Liz Bonin's film about the meat industry.
I, I think Liz is a brilliant example too of somebody who combines, everyone's talked about this on the panel, uh, information with emotion. You know, she responds emotion as a human being as well as an expert, and I think that's really important. Yeah, thanks for showing that. Uh, we've also got a clip from Bernie, yeah. which is um, a basic example of uh, Nat Geo shouting loud, taking risks, doing something that what ended up winning a, or getting an Oscar nomination? Uh, yeah, so Free Solo is a feature documentary, and it won the Oscar for Best Doc. Yay! That's fantastic. <laughs> and, um, and also the BAFTA. And it's a great example of... Um, that kind of immersive storytelling. When, uh, when I'm working with the younger members of our team on uh, s screenwriting, I teach them drama structure. I don't teach them documentary structure. And you can see that coming out in a lot of our work now, you know, it's, uh, because the audience is smarter, getting smarter and smarter. And, um, you know, and everybody wants to be engaged in that way. So what I'd like to do is play, it's actually the cinema trailer. Um, Free Solo is like the highest rated documentary across the world. It's the highest grossing documentary in theaters, which is amazing. So this is the cinema trailer. And then right after that, I just want to give Joel a heads up. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you is another project called One Day on Mars that we're working with The Garden on. And I have some images to show you, and it's the first time ever these images of Mars have been seen. And it's a great example of the innovation that, that we look for. It's data taken from the 2006 Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we, we're the first people to translate these and the digital images, and they really are quite breathtaking. But let's start with the cinema trailer for Free Solo, and then I'll talk you through the four images, four or five images. So if you haven't seen the film yet, I highly recommend it. So the first, the first images, so um, no, <coughs> no pictures, anyone? Um, so this is a, a gullied crater on Mars, which is pretty incredible. And if we skip to the next shot, um, desert dunes on the surface of Mars. And one of the great things that the show is going to do is it's translating the images of places that the first settlement may set up. Let's skip to the next one. And there are these salt deposits. Uh, I hope the colors are come. The colors are really saturated and beautiful. And uh, one more. That's the South Pole on Mars, which I think is absolutely stunning. And then my favorite one is the last. Um, oh, sorry, this is an ultimate. This is the, the highest mountain in the solar system, so Everest, Smeverest. <laughs> and, uh, and then last but not least, um, this a beautiful image, which almost looks like a textile design on mm. silk mm. to me. It mm. looks like a silk kimono. That's actually a Martian dust storm. Wow. So, uh, so one day on Mars, my colleague Simon Rakes is working on that with the garden <laughs> at the minute, so they're doing a terrific job. Fabulous. Just time for a couple of questions. Thanks for that. Anyone want to ask the panel anything? That's not incredible. Over here. Brilliant. Um, and just a question for uh, Fatima. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, at the moment, special spectral is a <laughs> it's an easy one. Um, <laughs> is um, Sunday nights, eight o'clock. Are you looking to expand? Um, have more across the schedule, more like epic pieces that you um, strip across the week? Um, absolutely. Sorry, I wasn't meaning to be rude then. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. Sundays at 8 p.m. and even Saturdays at 8 p.m. is we want to kind of reclaim them back for Specialist Factual. Um, and the team, Nicola um, Brown in particular, is kind of doing loads of work on trying to get ideas in that area. For me, Saturdays, 8 o'clock, is, is, you know, we, we're playing against the big, kind of shiny floor shows, so, you know, we want to try and find stuff that, you know, you can relax. It's, it's a much more grown-up audience. I think Sundays, 8 p.m., is a different kind of audience for us. Um, we want, you know, with the warm bath on the Sunday night, I think on Sunday, um, sorry, on Saturdays, on Sunday night, you can be a bit more intelligent, you can be a bit more cleverer. You know, I'd love to find some secret histories um, in that slot. I'd love to find some more pokey revisionist history um, documentaries in that slot that kind of come before my adventure 
um, shows at nine o'clock. So it's male skewing, um, but it's absolutely there to kind of um, for the taking at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we've just got time for one more question. The gentleman here. Um, uh, you, you, you talked about um, some of the ways in which you've reflected Britain back to British people at the BBC. I think one of the weaknesses of Channel 4's coverage outside current affairs, it's, it's international coverage. You talked about men uh, doing SS, SAS style adventure. Have you got any ambition to look at the rest of the world in, Absolutely. in a fresh way? Totally. It's, it's a massive ambition for me and also you know, within the team, it's something that we are really aware of, particularly the whole men thing. Um, in terms of stuff that's coming through at the moment, there's lots of programmes that, you know, even in the topical world that Shaminda um, looks after, the slate on that, we're trying to reflect back the kind of madness of the time that we're in at the moment. And I think um, it's an area that, again, is open for kind of reinvention. It's an area that... You know, you could do so many. You could do so many programs in that area that can either come from an arts point of view, that can come from. You know, if you look at um, the kind of the broad depth that you have at Specialist Factual at Channel Four, you can do live events, you can do, um, you know, um, stunts, you can do social experiments. All of those ambitions that we have are kind of there to kind of, you know, to be to be kind of reinvigorated. Sorry, I'm really waffling that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to own so, it. So, we could go on for I'm a long so time. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up because we have to make way for the next session. A huge thank you to Tom, to Fatima, to Bernie, to Victoria, hey. to Lucy, to, to Rob and Jeremy who set it up, and to Sheffield for organising it. Thank, thank you. you. And you, the audience.